Lots of talk about the Fed, about the economy, about China, about European natural gas, but how much really changed? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on the Fed and getting the economy back on track. I think Jay Powell said things that, to be blunt, were analytically indefensible. And Ken Jacobs of Lazard on how a changing Supreme Court could affect his business. You have an industry like insurance which has 50 different regulators in 50 different states. It was an extravaganza of talk and data this week, with President Biden finally having that talk with China's President Xi. President Xi actually emphasizing to President Biden that they should coordinate on macroeconomic policies, according to the Chinese foreign minister readout. The EU energy commissioner laying out plans to deal with further natural gas cuts from Russia. We will start saving gas now, and that uh, we have a blueprint to act together in a coordinated way if the situation worsens. Congress moved that CHIPS bill towards the president's desk, and to top it off, Senators Schumer and Manchin tried to pull a rabbit out of the hat with a surprise deal on climate and deficit reduction. This bill is far from perfect. It's a compromise. But it is, it's often how progress is made. And of course, the big one. The Fed setting a new funds rate, and Chair Powell saying they'll keep tightening. And we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. As the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases. But we shouldn't expect a lot more of that forward guidance. We think it's time to, to, to just go to a meeting by meeting basis and, and not provide the kind of clear guidance that we had provided on, on the way to neutral. And if the Fed thought it would have an easy time of it, the numbers kept coming in this week, making it more complicated, with GDP down for a second straight quarter on Thursday. And then on Friday, personal consumption and employment cost index numbers coming in higher than expected, showing that inflation is not close to done with us yet. And the markets? Well, they pretty much took it all in stride, with the S&P 500 up almost 4.3% for the week, ending the month with its best performance since November of 2020. And the Nasdaq posted even higher weekly gains, up some 4.7%, while bond yields remain subdued, with the 10-year yield ending the week at 2.65, giving up nearly 35 basis points. To help us sort through all of this, we welcome now Rebecca Patterson, Bridgewater Chief Investment Strategist, and Sarah Ketterer, CEO of Causeway Capital. So welcome both of you back to Wall Street Week again. Rebecca, let me start with you and what the Fed has in front of it. What is it trying to do? Well, the Fed is trying to get Goldilocks, and that means it wants to get inflation back down as fast as it can towards its 2% target without engineering a recession. And the market is giving it the benefit of the doubt. If you look at what's discounted into markets today, it is basically 2.5% inflation in, in just over a year and only a moderate slowdown in growth. And I think it's going to be almost impossible for the Fed to get everything it wants here. The porridge is going to be too hot or too cold. Either inflation will end up running much higher than the Fed's target and they risk losing their credibility, or if they're serious about getting inflation down, especially from the current high levels, it's going to require more, tar uh, more tightening, which we think is going to engineer a deeper recession. And that's what we're focused on. We think that within six to nine months, we're going to be looking at U.S. GDP that's negative two, negative three percent. So, Sarah, where are you on this? Because there felt like a tension this week between the markets, the futures markets on the one hand, saying exactly what Rebecca just said, and economists on the other hand saying, you know what, we got to really jack up the rates a lot to get inflation under control. Which side are you on? The more skeptical side. I think that's how we are as value managers, always want to have it proven to us. But, but note that we've had so much liquidity created, $4 trillion of of enlargement to the Fed's balance sheet since the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020, that's a lot of liquidity and it's still there. The Fed only just started to reduce, go into it from a quantitative easing to quantitative tightening starting June 1 of this year. And it's just beginning and it'll go from 30 billion a month and then bump that up to, to 60 billion a month uh, and letting those bonds roll off. That, again, starts to compress bank reserves. This will 
take it's quite can be quite lagged in its effect. So financial conditions will just tighten due to that reason alone, and we don't think markets anticipate that at all. And I think just building, Sarah, on your point, it's it's important to remember that the markets are really looking at. Um, the rates, they're not thinking as much about quantitative tightening or the roll off of the Fed's balance sheet, which is on autopilot. That's going to keep going. And so we don't have the Fed buying bonds. We don't have banks buying bonds anymore. And so we've seen bond yields come down in the last couple of weeks. But how much further can they come down without retail investors, institutional investors moving out of equities into bonds? I think what we've seen historically is when stocks go down, bonds rally, and you get that diversification. We've had that for the last few weeks. We didn't have it for the first half of the year. I don't think we can count on that as we get QT continuing, quantitative tightening continuing. Bond yields may come down, but it's going to be a lot harder for them to do that in this environment where the Fed's created a liquidity hole. It's taking liquidity out, and it's not as clear today who's going to fill that, who's going to supply the demand to keep bond yields going f further down. So let me pursue that liquidity <laughs> issue a little bit, Sarah, because you mentioned yeah. it, the lack of liquidity. Uh, that really makes the markets, as I understand it, much more volatile. Uh, so what does that do to an investor? How do you know, do you have a GPS at this point, given where we are? The key is to have a low entry price because you've got to have that margin of safety. And what this will mean, if, if massive increases in liquidity, and again, this wasn't just the Fed. Central banks globally were all at this, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan. And as they take all in unison, take liquidity out of the system, what pushed up market multiples, what made valuations expand, what made investors indifferent to valuation, it'll be just the opposite. And we've already seen that start because some of the hardest hit stocks globally, including in the U.S. market, have been had the most bloated valuations. So that we can expect more of that in the future where those stocks which had valuations unjustifiable based on the kind of cash they can generate are likely to see a re-rating downward. And the thing that we're watching, really, as we go forward, is what happens to growth and, therefore, earnings. Um, we expect that there's still a shoot -a drop here with a reduction in earnings expectations. We're seeing early days consumer confidence, that outlook expectations component this week, lowest level since 2013. Confidence leads activity. Activity is going to flow into earnings. If someone's spending goes down, that affects someone else's income. And so we think that even though stocks in the United States have fallen quite a lot year to date, that's almost exclusively reflecting higher discount rates and higher risk premium. We haven't seen lower earnings baked into yeah. equities yet, and we think that's still ahead of us. It's a really good point because margins in general across all industries are near peak levels in the U.S. That's not usually a sign of a the continued bull market. And furthermore, look at just some of those basic indicators like market cap to GDP. Take the U.S. market. It said it's another high, high level similar to where it was in prior to past uh, or at past peaks, say the top of the global financial crisis and also the TMT bubble in the late 90s, early 2000s. So none of those bode well for a market that supposedly is going to keep marching forward. At the same time, Rebecca, we've got data going in two different directions because GDP is down, consumer confidence, as you say, is down, At the same time, personal spending is up, and there's still a lot of money on the balance sheets, household balance sheets as well as a lot of corporate balance sheets. Yeah, so what we've seen is initially as we were coming out of the pandemic, if we can say that even, I'm not sure. <laughs> People were spending down the excess savings, the stimulus they received as a result of the pandemic. That is, is back down. Savings rate is back close to 5 percent. And the spending is being prolonged through credit. So people are now tapping into their credit cards um, to keep that spending going. But as interest rates continue to rise, the cost of servicing that credit continues to rise. We think that's going to be another inflection point lower and an important marker to watch to see when does consumption start taking a bigger step lower? So, Rebecca, uh, I'm sorry, Sarah, when does the other shoe drop on credit? Because if interest rates are going up, as Rebecca says, sooner or later, you got to pay the piper. Well, what will really spur a uh, blowout further in spreads, and therefore you know, that's going to have ramifications across the U.S. economy. In fact, globally, will be as inflation gets beyond, again, to our point, what the Fed is anticipating. And we may see some of that centered in housing. What, what we're, the momentum we're seeing in rents looks unstoppable, and that does have a very big impact on CPI. I think that's a great point. You know, a lot of people are looking at the housing activity, which has really slowed quickly as mortgage rates have gone up and said, oh, well, housing inflation will be gone in a, in a blink. 
but really as people can't afford homes, then they rent and rents are still resetting higher. So we have rent inflation that is still marching higher and housing inflation given the very, very constrained supplies and now rising household formation helping demand at the margin. We think we're in a position where housing inflation partly due to rents is gonna be sticky. Wages might start to, to moderate, but they're gonna be relatively sticky. Both of these things are a big reason why we think inflation is not likely to get back down towards the Fed's target as quickly as the market's price. Especially, Kara, Sarah, because people still have jobs, and if anything, wages are going up. They are. They're going up here, and the labor scarcity, it, just anecdotally, everywhere you go, you see the signs, help wanted, hmm. and it just seems as if a portion of the labor force just vanished. And it's not, again, specific to the U.S. We see this in Europe as well. They're, they're kind of crying need for more labor, and whether you know, immigration can fill that gap is very debatable. Okay, Sarah Ketter and Rebecca Patterson will stay with us as we take a look at earnings. It was a big earnings week as well for Wall Street. And that's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. About today, there could be little argument. Corporations reported their worst profit decline in 29 years. Revised Commerce Department figures for the first quarter showed that both the economy's downturn and the pressures of inflation were worse than previously reported. And international speculators began dumping dollars and acquiring gold with a fervor not seen for quite some time. That was the way things looked to Louis Ruckheiser on Wall Street Week back in 1975 when we were coming out of a recession. Today we may have inflation, but we haven't really seen a downturn in corporate profits, at least yet, much less a weaker dollar. We've seen just the reverse, in fact. Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater and Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital have stayed with us. So, Sarah, let me go to you on the equities question. We had a lot of earnings out this week. It went both ways, but I think sort of overall earnings came in pretty well so far. They have. And I think both Rebecca and I have commented on the, um, what's happened in the, it, the past isn't necessarily reflective of the future. In other words, there are so many challenges ahead in a persistent inflationary environment for companies in terms of cost increases, not to mention a consumer that's deliberately being reined in, that um, it, this just may be a really tough next several quarters of reporting. How tough, hard to say, but, but unlikely to be buoyant. And that's to the point that um, we've seen multiple derating. Now we may very well see earnings fall too. And that's typically what happens in market pullbacks, both multiples and earnings fall. And that, again, is a, a phenomena that will likely occur globally. So, Rebecca, you have a little bit of money at Bridgewater that you have to put to work every once in a while. Uh, what about the question, particularly of debt versus uh, equity? You mentioned before the question of when stocks are attractive. We had that Bank of America fund managers report coming out saying, look, you're better off right now going into bonds. We, we don't see bonds as, as attractive at this point um, in the U.S., but also in places like Europe. Um, we, you know, with the Fed still tightening, with the Fed demand for bonds now gone, it's going the other way. Banks were huge buyers of bonds last year. They're gone. We think there's going to be a greater challenge for demand to meet supply there. Um, but there was, a, there was another great point uh, just made when we were referencing 1975 there, which was this fall in the dollar and this move into gold. And, and it's so interesting to compare what was happening then versus now. Uh, and, and back then, we saw the dollar fall in part because people thought that inflation expectations were unanchored and high inflation was going to undermine the value of currency. And as you just said, it's the opposite right now. We've seen a strong dollar as the U.S. has looked like the nicest house in a bad neighborhood. What, what I would say, though, as we think about earnings and equities and bonds and people's portfolios, is that we're in a world that's so different from the last decade when it comes to currency markets. Volatility is picking up. And as we have inflation surprises, monetary policy surprises, and a huge cone of uncertainty, we should expect that FX volatility to continue. And it flows through to companies, I think, two big ways. One, just if the companies themselves are hedging that risk or not. So we are seeing multinationals underperforming more domestic companies by wide margins just year to date. We think that is likely to continue as these kind of relatively wild moves continue in currencies. 
And then more broadly, if you're thinking about your portfolio, what currency are you denominated in? What currency risk are you taking? And it can make a very big difference to your performance. I mean, just year to date, if you think about if you hedged a foreign currency equity or didn't hedge, it could be the difference in 10 percentage points in performance mm. for those stocks. And we think that's going to continue and possibly escalate. So I would just say as we think about equities, we think about bonds and earnings, um, I would also make sure not to ignore currencies as part of that equation for your total return. So Sarah, take all that and put it together. I, I think if you're somebody who's really look at a particular kind of value investor, you look for good value in terms of low valuations, buying at the bottom, moving up with it. What's attractive to you right now? I, the Go where the currencies have been the weakest, where there's potential for a a return to some sort of more normal currency valuation. And the euro might be a good place to start. The euro is off about 12% versus the dollar year to date and uh, maybe 15 over the last 12 months. So yes, it's on sale and it has been painful having stocks denominated in euro unless they were dollar earners. But this does present an opportunity because likely the Eurozone will go into some sort of pullback as energy becomes scarce, particularly this winter, natural gas in particular. But out of that is the recovery, especially given the amount of spending that the Eurozone has in mind in order to revitalize their economies. And um, you know, work for the US, it's likely to work for the Eurozone. So there are stocks that companies now buying back large portions of their outstanding market cap, that's really interesting. If, you can, if they're that confident in the future and they know a whole lot more about it than we do in terms of their own companies, ex there are a number of European banks, Unicredit in Italy is one example. Not only are they buying back 14% of their stock, they have a 6% dividend yield. That's like 20% payout yield. That's fantastic on on 40% of tangible book value. You may think that sounds terrifying. Who wants to be in Italy right now? There's political <laughs> uncertainty. But that's exactly when you want to buy. Because the next stage, you get back to 60 or 70% of tangible book, and you've doubled your money. And I guess I would contrast that. Like that You might be seeing great opportunities in, in specific companies. Um, but when we look at Europe overall, for, from our perspective, we are still bearish. Now, there might be a timing element, Sarah, between what you're saying and I'm saying. but. Um, agreed that they're doing some fiscal stimulus. I think with the potential for them to lose more energy supply in the winter, it will be important to see if the governments take those losses off the companies and onto the government balance sheets, just like we saw the U.S. do for some U.S. companies during COVID. Will Europe do that as well? That would certainly be a positive for European equities if that move yeah. happens. In the absence of that, I do think you have to reckon with the ECB tightening and what is an incredible incredibly challenging environment. So the European Central Bank slowing growth even worse than what we're seeing in the United States so far and very high, multi-decade high inflation. So they're stuck yeah. between a rock and a hard place. And you mentioned Italy. I, you know, look, Italy tends to go through governments roughly every 18 months, uh, going every back minute. to World War II. So this is not yeah. that unusual. However, Italy right now desperately needs these fiscal transfers from the European Union. And if this, this government, which isn't as cohesive today, is unable to pass reforms, the fiscal tap gets turned off. And if the fiscal tap gets turned off while the ECB is tightening, I think European equities are really going to struggle. So at the risk of anybody head hurt here, let me add a whole other level of complexity, China. Uh, you talk about somebody who's going through a bit of a rough patch right now in terms of growth, COVID-19, COVID-0 policy and things like that. Are there any attractive potentials actually over there, Sarah? China is very complicated at the moment, to your point, because it's been a draconian lockdowns. And back to Europe, I mean, so many European multinationals have business in China or do have some sort of trade arrangement, so it's been tough for them. There are all kinds of these supply-side shock problems. And central banks don't really do anything about that. They're all about the demand side. So that's one of the reasons why Europe's likely to recover, because they, they don't need to engage in massive tightening and offset inflation. Good part of that is supply-related, and some of it's coming from China. And how how long the Chinese government intends to strangle their economy is the big debate because they can't go too far because the pact is we rule with an autocratic arm and you have prosperity. If they take away the, if the government takes away prosperity, the autocracy may be in danger. And that's what makes China so fascinating, potentially combustible at the moment. And, and just adding to that, you know, I think one of the things we got out of the Politburo meeting this week was we're going to stay focused on infrastructure stimulus in China. We're not going to increase the focus on consumption. 
And so when we think about how the different levers of Chinese growth flow through to multinational companies, it's important to understand that nuance. If it's infrastructure-led, that's going to have a different spillover effect to other companies around the world, commodity-related companies, companies that are servicing that infrastructure versus the consumer. Um, but, you know, to the fragility of China today, if you go to the youth unemployment rate in China, I'm sure you've reported this. Yes. It's a big deal. Unemployment almost double what we have in the United States, close to 20 percent. That's something China can't tolerate. And so I would expect over the coming months we're going to see more and more steps for them to try to make sure these young uh, adults have jobs, whether they're with the state-owned enterprises, through some of these infrastructure projects, et cetera. But I am concerned that growth in China isn't going to recover that quickly in the second half of the year, which, again, folds into this bigger global growth picture. Europe's slowing, China's slowing, the U.S. is slowing. How do we see stocks rallying sustainably in that environment? At the same time, yeah. President Xi does have a party plenum coming up he sometime does. in October, November. He might want to make sure that he gets reelected for yet a third term. Thank you so very much to Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater and Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital. Up next, what's happening next week on Global Wall Street? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look ahead at next week, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. We'll be looking at China PMIs as mortgage boycotts heap more pressure on distressed developers and intensify the housing slump. A rise in COVID-19 cases may have also hurt sentiment in the services sector. Meanwhile, central bank meetings in India and Australia will also be significant for investors in this region. Australia's central bank likely to lift its inflation forecast, hike rates by 50 basis points and flag more tightening ahead as it races to restrain consumer price gains. Here in Europe, we're looking ahead to the OPEC Plus meeting next week to see if that charm offensive by President Joe Biden with his Saudi counterpart has paid off. We'll see if the Saudis pump any more oil to alleviate prices at the pump. And here in the UK, switching focus, the summer of strikes. We've had rail strikes, we've had tube strikes. Those are set to continue on Monday with walkouts from barristers and workers at telecom giant BT. The Bank of England, meanwhile, expected to hike rates for the sixth consecutive time as the economy here in the UK continues to slow and members of the Conservative Party, well, they'll be receiving their ballot papers and will be able to cast their votes for the two leading contenders now to take over from Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative government and Prime Minister of the UK. Stateside, the tech earnings continue. PayPal, Pinterest, Airbnb, and Advanced Micro Devices all report next week. That's alongside Uber and Lyft. What are they going to tell us about the gig economy and fuel prices? And it doesn't stop there. Starbucks and Under Armour are also on deck. We've also got plenty of Fed speak coming up. The presidents of the St. Louis, Chicago, and Cleveland Fed are all due to speak on what comes next for the central bank. And then payroll Friday, the jobs report is in the spotlight. Anything under 100,000 is likely to ring alarm bells at the Federal Reserve. An extremely tight labor market that used to be a point of pride will now see Achilles heel of the U.S. economy. Does that change next week? We're going to find out. Thanks to Juliet Sally, Tom McKenzie and Kriti Gupta. Coming up, we have a Supreme Court taking a different direction on a wide range of issues. But what could it mean for the markets, and for that matter, deals? We ask Ken Jacobs of Lazard Frere. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The Supreme Court is rocking the boat for us all. In an historic term, the court managed to turn the heat up on just about everything it touched from its overturning Roe versus Wade. The health and life of women in this nation are now at risk. It will save the lives of millions of children and it will give families hope. To its permitting concealed weapons. Unquestionably the biggest Second Amendment ruling in more than a decade from this court. To its telling the EPA to back off on regulating power plants. 
The U.S. Supreme Court has restricted the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to curb greenhouse gases from power plants. The debate continues on the wisdom of all these decisions, but taken together, they raise important questions for business and the markets. Questions about how the rule of law that underpins our entire system will work under this new court. With some, like Senator Portman of Ohio, saying it's just an appropriate reminder that the power ultimately remains with the Congress, not the regulators. And that's what the Supreme Court was, was essentially saying, is that, wait a minute, we've got to be sure that the Congress, which is the representative of the people, uh, you know, has, has the final say. While critics like Larry Tribe say the court has abandoned principle in favor of personality. It strikes me as profoundly unprincipled because the Supreme Court has long said that decisions of great durability should not be overruled in the absence of some extraordinary change other than the mere personnel of the court. And to tell us whether there might really be a connection between what the Supreme Court is doing on the one hand and the business world on the other, we welcome a true leader in the business world. He is the chairman and CEO of Lazard Ferrer. He is Ken Jacobs. Ken, great to have you back on Thank you, David. Wall Street Week. Great to have you. Be here. So we tend to think of things like abortion and social issues in the Supreme Court and even some of the regulatory issues as more in the zone of politics or even political philosophy. Can they affect the business world as well? Yes. So when you step back and you think about the United States, the U.S. has a handful of really true competitive advantages. One is um, rule of law, uh, a second is uh, demographics, uh, and a third is uh, one market. And by one market, we're, we're a market of 300, 350 million people with essentially one set of rules. So when a company goes to do business in the United States, by and large, it's, it's one set of rules for the whole country. And what the Supreme Court is doing is, is essentially saying, look, uh, the administrative state has become unwieldy. Uh, it's taken on too much responsibility. Uh, Congress really should do a better job of writing laws more specifically. And we're going to start to whittle back some of the things that the administrative is doing. Well, on, on paper, that sounds great. I mean, perhaps there'll be less regulation. Maybe the laws will be clearer, better written. But the reality is Congress is rife with polarization. It's difficult to get anything done without a supermajority. So the reality is that there's a vacuum. And so we're going from a, from, a, from a place where we have a clear sense. We may not like all the regulation, but we have a clear sense of the rules to a place where the rules are uncertain. And increasingly, the states are stepping in and making decisions on many of these rules. And what's ending up happening is, is we're going to end up with uh, multiple rules with multiple states and candidly probably written by uh, and by groups or people that aren't as competent as exists in Congress. So and that's worrisome. Take us into your business specifically. You've got a very large advisory business. You've also mm -hmm. got a big asset management business. How do those challenges with perhaps uh, a very diffuse set of rules and regulations, mm -hmm. laws, how could it potentially affect your well, business? Well, let's take asset management as an example. That's probably the easier one of the two to, to see the impact. So you have a state that essentially says, look, we don't want to hire an asset manager that is worried about climate. And so they will restrict uh, the ability of a uh, state pension fund to invest in that manager. Another state may say, you know what? We will only invest in managers that uh, take into account climate. Now, if it's a small state with very little population and very little um, assets under management in their state pension funds, maybe it doesn't matter that much. But when we start having big states dueling on this, it's a real problem. Well, we're starting to see it. If of I course can say this in places like Texas and Florida and California and New yep. York, just to pick four, uh -huh. that seem to have different attitudes toward these things. Are you seeing it affect your business so far, or is this more on the horizon? It's, I would say it's on the horizon, but it's worrisome. And you, you sort of think about it. You have an industry like insurance, which has 50 different regulators in 50 different states. That's a complex industry, but that's a real exception in the U.S. economy. Most of the U.S. economy is dominated by company or, or driven by companies that are able to operate in all 50 states without a concern. And this is something that I think really runs the risk of um, upsetting one of the true competitive advantages of the United States. Uh, is there another factor here with the Supreme Court, which we saw, saw this last term, mm -hmm. where they're changing their mind? They're overturning precedent that's been on the books for a long time. <clears throat> and there's a reason for what we call in the legal business stare decisis, right. right? So there's a predictability for business. Okay, so go back to what I thought were the three or four competitive advantages of the U.S. 
uh, unified, big unified market uh, uh, demographics, and the third one is rule of law. And rule of law, when you really think it through, is really about predictability, certainty, uh, conservatism in that sense, the idea that you can predict what's going to happen, you have an idea of what the rules are. This is kind of upsetting the apple cart when you go back and you, you shift. And what does that do to the competitiveness of the United States uh, over against Europe on the one hand or China on the other? I mean, China certainly has had issues with some of that unpredictability in recent days. Yeah, so look, this is not overnight going to upset the uh, competitiveness of, of the U.S. versus Europe and China, but it's headed in the wrong direction. Uh, China, the advantage China has uh, compared to almost any other market is it's a billion, two billion, three of people with one market. And, and in many respects, that is the advantage that a lot of major Chinese companies have is a very big unified market. Uh, and so that's, that's the risk. Talk about your business right now, because sure. uh, we've got a very strong dollar. As I understand, that may have affected your business to some mm -hmm. extent. Uh, we also have a slowdown. We've seen just this week we saw the GDP numbers. How is it affecting your business? So on uh, one end of the spectrum, it's, it's highly resilient. Uh, the advisory business had a strong first half, and the outlook for the second half seems, seems pretty strong to us right now. Uh, the question for the advisory business is going to be what happens in 2023. Uh, what's the build like of backlog, uh, back, uh, build of uh, assignments and, and, and such into the uh, latter part of this year? And that largely depends on what happens in the credit markets over the course of the next couple of months or so. Uh, the asset management business has obviously been subject to the turbulence of markets globally, uh, but performance has really improved dramatically, as we would hope it would in an environment where quality and value should be performing. Uh, the challenge in our business, just compared to many of our peers, is we are global. We're, we're an international business with, uh, in the asset management business, a high exposure non-dollar assets, and in the advisory business, a very significant, significant business outside the United States. So the impact of the move of the euro and the impact, I mean, you can see it on the Bloomberg dollar index, the move of the dollar against virtually every currency in the world has, has negatively affected us. But, the, but at this point, it looks like, you know, there's been a 30 percent move in the dollar against Bloomberg index and, and against the euro over the course of the last couple of years. I would guess that there's probably another, not another 30% to go. So maybe the worst is over. I'm not sure I'm calling a recovery yet <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a, and a weakening of the dollar, but I think probably the worst is over. Come back to the uncertainty we were talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, we were talking about the Supreme Court, but there's all sorts of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace right now. Yes. We don't know exactly where the economy is going. We don't know where a lot of geopolitics are going, things like that. Is that causing people to sit on their money, essentially, particularly in the advisory business? Do you have CEOs saying, you know well, what, I think I'm just it, not ready to move right now? I think it's everywhere because what's happening happened is, is we've gone from, just taking the economy as an example, you know, three months ago, everybody was focused on, highly focused on, on inflation, as they should be. Today, inflation's in the rear view mirror, at least with regard to the bond market, and now everybody is focused on recession. And so the question now is, uh, where's, where's inflation going to be? It's clearly going to come down from where it was, 9 or 10 percent. Does it level out at 4 or 5 or 2 or 3? There's a big debate about that. But on, in addition to that, we now have the question of uh, recession. Uh, how deep? How long? And until there is a, what I'd say, a new consensus, a new set of convictions, uh, people are going to be cautious about putting money to work. People are going to be cautious about making big decisions. And I think that's going to unfold over the course of the fall. Ken, finally, on the inflation front, you take a long-term view for your business. Mm -hmm. uh, are there some structural factors that suggest we are going to have a higher level of inflation than we have in the past, whether it's demographics, whether it's uh, not a deglobalization, but something of a pulling back from some of the globalization, some of the frictions between the United mm -hmm. States and China, for example? Well, the one friction that is clear is we all got spoiled by just in a just-in-time economy, where everything was minutes away or and predictable. Uh, supply chains have been interrupted, logistics have been interrupted. Part of it is COVID. Part of it is uh, a shift in um, uh, wages. China has become a more expensive place to do business, so supply chain shift as well to places that are perhaps less reliable. And as a result of that, we're not in a just-time economy anymore. And uh, there's, there's probably more friction than there used to be. And that probably is something we're going to have to live with. Ken, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. That is Ken Jacobs. He is the chairman and CEO of Lazard Ferrer. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. And we welcome once again our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, a lot happened this week. But let's start at the end of the week with what you told us last week was the most important indicator that we should be looking at in the economy, and that is the Employment Cost Index. It came in. It came in above survey. David, we, we weren't sure what was going to be happening with uh, wage inflation. We hoped that the indications in some of the monthly surveys that earnings growth was slowing and that that might slow the whole inflation process would materialize. That didn't happen. Looks like inflation is running at a pretty stable rate. It's still two and a half points at least above where it was before this whole episode uh, started. Uh, it depends on just how you look at the figures, but really no evidence of a significant decline. If you look at the private sector and you take out benefits, then it's uh, going up a bit. If you look at the 12-month figure, it's going up a bit. Those may be the wrong things uh, to do, so it may be better to look at the overall figure. But I think it's showing what I've been saying for quite some time now, which is that we are an ingrained moderate to high inflation uh, economy. Nothing like 9% inflation is built in, but inflation above four looks to be pretty securely built in. And if productivity growth doesn't accelerate, it could be uh, worse than that uh, quite easily. So I'm pretty uncomfortable with uh, the current uh, situation. And I think it just points to uh, the difficulties that the Fed uh, is facing going forward and confirms the broad diagnosis that we have an overheated economy that's not going to fix itself. And therefore, we're not likely to get out of this uh, excess inflation situation without having a recession. So, so, Larry, you have been steadfast on this program and elsewhere uh, on your views about inflation. And yet there's something of a debate going on right now behind, between, on the one hand, the markets and on the other hand, economists, with the markets sort of saying, OK, the Fed will hike for a while and then they'll start backing off next year and actually we'll have some reductions in 2023. But the economists say, boy, the economy doesn't look that way. We're going to have to keep going and keep it pretty high. What do you do when you have that kind of debate? Yeah, we'll see what judgment the Fed's make it makes. Uh, the challenge they're going to have, and it's a agonizing challenge, and it's why it would be better if we weren't in the kind of configuration we were in, and it would be better if we had not overstimulated uh, the economy last year, is that on the one hand, I think you are likely to see a significant slowdown in growth. You are likely to see recessionary forces develop over the next year. And on the other hand, it's going to take a lot to get the inflation out of the system. The danger, David, is that they don't uh, persevere strongly enough in restrictive policy. And that's what gets you a stagflation situation where growth slows and you don't beat the inflation out of the system. It's like if you don't complete your course of antibiotics and then your illness comes back and the drugs are bacteria resistant. On the other hand, I, I don't think we can deny that if they do what's necessary to contain uh, inflation, then it's not going to be a happy economic situation uh, over, uh, some, over some interval. Secretary Yellen said yesterday that she held out the prospect of uh, getting out of this without unemployment uh, going above uh, five. I've got enormous respect for her as an economist, but I have to say that statement uh, greatly surprised me. It didn't surprise me as much as the Fed saying we were going to get out of this with 4.1 percent uh, unemployment. But I don't see any basis for thinking that either of those statements is a reasonable uh, prediction, given what we know. My own research uh, with Olivier Blanchard uh, 
looking carefully at vacancy statistics, looking carefully at quit statistics, would suggest that just to get to a neutral posture with respect to uh, inflation, we're going to have to take unemployment up towards five. And in order to bring down inflation, we're going to have to be restrictive, which means an unemployment rate above five. So, Larry, you mentioned some of the questions about the neutral unemployment rate we heard about from Secretary Young. We also heard about uh, where we were with a neutral rate on interest rates from Jay Powell. What do you economists do when you put together these neutral rates? Look, I think Jay Powell said things that, to be blunt, were analytically indefensible. He claimed twice in his press conference that the Fed was now at the neutral uh, interest rate calling it two and a half. It's elementary that the level of the neutral interest rate depends upon the inflation rate. We've got on the most quoted measure, a 9.1 percent inflation measure. If you extrapolate it off core or something, it's four or five uh, percent uh, inflation. There is no conceivable way that a two and a half percent interest rate in an economy inflating like this is anywhere near neutral. And if you think it is neutral, you are misjudging the posture of policy in a fundamental way. So I was very sorry uh, to hear him uh, say that and frankly surprised. He said back in 2018 that the neutral interest rate, that the Fed was approaching the neutral interest rate at a time when uh, the inflation rate was 1.9 percent. How he could be saying the same thing uh, today when the inflation rate is where it is, is inexplicable uh, to me. And it's the same kind of, to be blunt, wishful thinking that got us into the problems we have now with the use of the term uh, transitory. So I hope the rigor of the economic analysis uh, at the Federal Reserve is going to step up. So, Larry, in the meantime, we have uh, some legislation coming out of uh, Capitol Hill, something perhaps we didn't even expect. We had the CHIPS Act, but now we have this proposed Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, last week on this program, you sent a powerful message to people who were saying increasing taxes actually might be inflationary. You said that's really not true at all. Uh, I suspect one of the people you were communicating with may have been Joe Manchin through Wall Street Week. I don't want to ask you about what you've said specifically specifically Joe Manchin, but give us your reaction to what the proposal is now that's come up with respect to increasing taxes, yes, paying for it, but also addressing climate. I was glad to see the bill. I think it's going to reduce the rate of inflation because it's going to reduce deficits and demand over time, because it's going to use the federal government's power to negotiate lower prices for pharmaceuticals, and because it's going to increase uh, supply of uh, energy. So demand, supply, pricing power, all working to reduce inflation. I think it's going to help the environment uh, because of the climate change measures. I think it's going to help fairness uh, in our country because of the expansions in uh, health care availability. I think it's going to help fairness in our country by closing uh, some very important tax loopholes that allow very profitable companies to avoid paying uh, any, uh, any taxes. Could the bill be uh, improved? Uh, of course. I was really sorry to see that the very important uh, enabling legislation for the international tax agreements that Secretary Yellen has uh, negotiated didn't get included in this. And while I was glad to see progress in reducing the carried interest uh, loophole. Frankly, there's still some loopholes uh, in uh, the solution. I think we should be saying that all carried interest, when realized, is taxed as ordinary income when the investor uh, takes it out. And this bill is still well short of that in a variety of respects. Wow, that really is a ringing endorsement. Thank you so much. That's our special contributor, Larry Summers, here on Wall Street Week. Of course, for, he's from Harvard University.
Coming up, the one place in the world where the supply chain has worked all too well. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. It's the economy, stupid. But which economy? There's no end of worrying and complaining about the U.S. economy these days from too much inflation. We certainly see peak inflation coming sometime in the second half. To too high a risk of recession. I think there are many reasons why we're going to have a severe recession and a severe debt and financial crisis. To supply chains that just won't cooperate. Fix the supply chain. Uh, these are all things that will be beneficial to the country writ large. But through it all, the one thing the United States does not seem to lack is jobs. Just about twice as many jobs as we have people to fill them. You are still seeing jobs added at pretty substantial pace. And that robust demand for labor may just be the one thing that keeps the wolf of recession from our collective door. You got some up and you got some down. You got the job market very strong. And yet at the same time, you've got GDP growth stalling out. And so the Fed's got to figure out how hard to step on the brake. So as we all continue to worry and complain about the U.S. economy, and as the markets continue to be buffeted by all that worrying and complaining. You've got so many different cross currents that are going on and so many different forces acting on the market that you have these little mini moments. Take a moment to consider the plight of China right now. Yes, China, that economic miracle, now facing slowing growth and a deeply troubled property market. Unfortunately, the private sector is, where, is what's collapsing. As far as the eye can see, uh, that China is going to take a, a while to recover. And COVID shutdowns that have wreaked havoc with companies like Philips needing inputs for overseas markets. The second quarter uh, was impacted by a lot of headwinds. We had China lockdown, supply issues, uh, and rising inflation. And Elon Musk's Tesla not getting what it needs for the China market. Q2 was a unique quarter for Tesla due to a prolonged shutdown of our Shanghai factory. The past few years have, have been uh, quite a few force majeures, and uh, it's, been, it's been kind of supply chain hell for several years. Now you can add to China's woes an oversupply of young college graduates. It has 10 times the number of college graduates that it had only 10 years ago. And way too many of them cannot find jobs, with almost 20% of young people unemployed, twice the rate in the United States. So as those of us in the United States complain about too few workers, our Chinese counterparts complain about too many. But in the end, whichever version of labor issues you have, it does come back to James Carville 30 years ago. It's the economy, stupid. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.